So this morning we were thinking about models of neurons. For the afternoon, we're going to be thinking about ways of summarizing what neurons are responding to without really thinking so much how those responses are generated. There's just a mystery black box in the brain with sensory input and neural spiking, and we're going to try to relate the two to each other using generalized linear models, which you'll see fairly often in neuroscience. They're fairly widely used ways of summarizing the spiking activity of neurons, and they have a nice a uh, combination of they have, they allow you, despite being called linear models, they are nonlinear models. That's what the generalized means. Uh, not sure why they picked that name. Um, so they have a nice ability to capture sort of linear, nonlinear transformations of a sensory input or a, any input by neurons, but are simple enough that they don't require a lot of data to fit and they're pretty easy to fit, and they kind of work well for summarizing what a neuron is responding to and what it's not responding to. After this uh, kind of overview section, we'll go through a notebook where you're going to be fitting a GLM on a retinal neuron recording from Marcus Meister's lab. Uh, and there is a second notebook, which is looking at simulating the dynamics of a Morris Lacar model neuron. So if you liked the stuff in the morning and you finished the GLM work, you're welcome to play around with that as well. Um, that has like varying levels of complexity from just simulating the spiking activity over time to if you're interested, there's a bonus challenge in there to try to plot some milk lines of the neuron and see how its phase portrait changes as you change the input to the cell. So if you're interested in doing that and have questions because it goes a bit beyond what we talked about in the morning, let me know and I'm happy to go through that with you. Um, I'm assuming you guys are doing the notebooks in pairs again. Is that what the table setup is for? Okay. And the notebooks are posted to GitHub. I updated them just at the end of lunch because I forgot to delete the solutions. So if you pulled them earlier, you should pull them again. Ah, thank you about that. And yes, we'll see how that goes. But before we get there, I wanted to talk about some of the background of generalized linear models and what they do and how they work. And we'll pick up kind of where we left off before lunch was that we have a stimulus feature and we have recorded spikes. And what we want to do without thinking too much about how this is happening in the brain is say how you go from one to the other. If you have a stimulus brightness of a screen that a mouse is looking at, odor concentration, movements, more complex things like annotations of behavior. A GLM is an encoding model that tells you how that stimulus could be used to predict the spiking of neurons. So in general, neural encoding can be thought of as a problem of learning this conditional probability of why the recorded spikes given X some feature of the stimulus. So given that the animal saw a stimulus X, what pattern of spiking activity do we expect to observe in the brain? Encoding models are all about summarizing how we expect a neuron to respond in terms of a fit filter or some fit description of cell activity. And you've all seen encoding models before. One of the most basic examples is a tuning curve. So this is, I should have had the citation there. This is a Hubel and Weasel 1968 paper where they measure the tuning curve of cat cortex neurons in response to drifting bars at different orientations. So in A, you see um, the direction of movement of a drifting bar that's being displayed on the screen. And to the right is the membrane potential of the neuron. And you can see that for some orientations, the cell doesn't spike. For other orientations, it spikes a lot. And this is a V1 neuron that has a tuning for a preferred orientation of a moving stimulus. And if you present a bunch of different moving stimuli, you can create a tuning curve that looks like this, where you have a sensory feature of interest, the orientation of the bar, and a predicted firing rate of the neuron. So this is an encoding model showing how the neuron is encoding information about the moving bar. So there's a couple uh, 
steps that took place here that are kind of implicit. You have to kind of stare at the data and try to guess what it is that the neuron is caring about. Is it the color of the bar? Is it the speed at which it's moving? Is it the orientation? And finding a good encoding model is mostly a problem of seeing how much you can explain the spiking of a neuron. How much uncertainty can you remove about when a neuron is going to spike and when it's not going to spike. And if you fit a good GLM, people say that you've explained a lot of the variance. You've, you've come up with something that can predict very nicely, given a stimulus, what a neuron is going to do. So uh, tuning curves are an example of encoding models. And what these tuning curves give you, what an encoding mo model gives you, is a prediction about the firing rate of the neuron conditioned on the value of the sensory stimulus. So if I draw a vertical slice through this uh, diagram here, my encoding model, my neural tuning curve, says that I have a predicted distribution of firing rates that I expect to see if I were to present the same drifting bar multiple times. I expect that I'm going to see an average firing rate of, say, around uh, 35 hertz. And there's going to be some variance around that average. Some trials, I'll see a few more spikes. Some trials, I'll see a few less spikes. But my encoding model is saying that I'm pretty confident, or I'm, I'm reasonably expecting that, say, an observed, a trial where I observed 38 spikes is likely to happen. And my model says that I'm unlikely to observe, say, six spikes in response to a drifting grading at this orientation. So the model is saying kind of what distribution of spiking activity we expect to see conditioned on the value of the stimulus. And you can draw another vertical slice through this tuning curve for a different stimulus orientation. And what you might see here is a different Gaussian distribution with a different mean and a different standard deviation. So in this model, I'm saying that if I expect, if I'm presenting a stimulus at a different orientation, of minus 28 degrees, I am likely to observe six spikes and I'm very unlikely to observe 38 spikes. So a good uh, encoding model of a neuron is maximizing the likelihood of the data given the model, which means that if I take a series of stimuli and observed spikes, all of those pairings are going to give me points that are kind of high up on this probability distribution. The model's always going to say, you saw 38 spikes. Yes, that's what I expected to see when you presented this orientation. Um, so the goal is to create a model that kind of lines up these predicted firing rates with what you actually see in the data. And this process of maximizing the likelihood of the data via optimization of model parameters is at the core of the process of fitting statistical models in neuroscience. You can get fancier than the 1D tuning curve. This is a 2D neural encoding surface for feature, features of faces that was uh, fit to a recorded neuron by Doris Sow's lab in 2017. They recorded from neurons in face patches and found that certain facial features were good predictors of changes in the firing rates of neurons. So they did PCA, I think, over a set of faces and found these different axes over which faces varied. Say the depth of the eye is changing as you go from left to right on the x-axis, and the luminance of the forehead is the best I could come up with, is changing as you go up and down on the y-axis. If you take these features and then you plot the firing rate of your recorded neuron conditioned on, for a given face conditioned on where it lies in this facial feature space, you can find that individual axes of feature space, like this facial feature one, are good predictors of the firing rate of the neuron, that you're able to capture that the cell is strongly modulated by this first feature, and the cell is not so much modulated by the second feature. As you move up and down facial feature two space, you don't really see a strong change in the response of the cells. So you can have 1D tuning curves, you can have 2D tuning surfaces. You could also, if you had, say, a discrete set of behaviors, fit a GLM that's just predicting the activity of a neuron when a particular behavior happens. So it's not necessarily a curve over a parameter value, it's just how much a given feature of your data set contributes to the response of your neuron. So I don't know, you guys didn't do GLMs yesterday, did you? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. So for like the hypothalamus data set, you could fit a GLM to see to what extent knowing whether the mouse is interacting with a male or a female allows you to predict how the neuron is responding. So it doesn't have to be like a continuously valued feature the way that we're showing here. Yeah, and so in this case, you could describe the neuron very nicely just by saying that the spiking activity of the cell is awaited some of these features where you spike proportional to the value of this first facial feature and the value of the second one. So, yeah. Yeah, this particular one, yeah. So the, a good model would probably have a high weight on S1 and a low weight on S2 because changing S1 doesn't change spiking. Yeah, uh, but you could maybe have a different neuron that was modulated by combinations or something. So in this case, yeah, these weights would be kind of parameters of your model that you would fit in order to match the observed activity of your cell. And I guess there's like, you'll capture some of the variants that way. There might be residual variants that you can't fit with just a weighted sum of S1 plus S2. Like say there was some weird nonlinearity where you respond to intermediate values of a facial feature, but not high or low values. A simple linear model like this wouldn't be able to capture that kind of structure. You'd have to get a little fancier. So we're going to build an example encoding model. I made these slides when I was teaching at Northwestern and there's a PI there, Andrew Meary, who studies mouse climbing behavior. So the example that I used here is the spiking of a mystery neuron somewhere in motor cortex that's spiking as a function of how fast the mouse is climbing. You can pick whatever simulus you want. Um, but let's imagine that we have a neuron and we have a mouse climbing at different speeds and we see that there's a correlation between how fast the mouse is climbing and how much the neuron is spiking. And if you take say a bunch of trials and on each trial or each like window of time, you could plot the climbing speed of the mouse and the firing rate of the neuron and see some correlation between the two. So already we see that there's some relationship between this variable that we're measuring, the climbing speed and this variable of neural activity, the firing rate. And we want to see if we can capture this with a model and how good a job the model does of explaining the spiking of the neuron given the climbing speed of the mouse. And because we noticed that there's some spread here, ideally we want a model that also tells us how much variance we expect there to be from trial to trial when the animal's climbing at the same speed. So we want to capture this, this scatter that's happening here. So looking at this data, it looks like there's a pretty linear relationship between the two. And an example of a way that you might try to build a model that relates this climbing speed to the spiking activity would be to say that there is a spiking rate of the neuron, an expected spiking rate, which is just some linear function of the stimulus, which in this case is the climbing speed. So we have a parameter W, which is to what extent an increase in climbing speed translates to an increase in the firing rate of the cell. This W is an unknown parameter that we're going to have to fit in our model. And then on top of that, we have a predicted distribution of spikes. So on a given trial at a given climbing speed, we don't always expect to see the same number of spikes, but there's gonna be some spread around that. So we have another, oops, and yeah, in this case, we're assuming that it's Gaussian, that the variance in the number of spikes is just uniformly distributed or is Gaussianly distributed around the mean with some variance sigma that we're defining here. So that if you condition on a given climbing speed, you have some expected distribution of firing rates. So this is our conditional probability of our firing rate given our stimulus. Uh, doop. So, what is the relationship between these two equations? Obviously that our underlying spike rate is being fed into our predicted spiking distribution. And our spiking distribution is giving us the expected uh, distribution of spikes that we observe on repeated trials of the same stimulus. We can plug this underlying spike rate into our distribution and just write out the equation for a Gaussian and we get this conditional probability model of our firing rate of our cell conditioned on our stimulus. So we have now built this statistical model that's saying given that 
the, the mouse was climbing at this speed. This is how many spikes we expect the, the cell to fire, and this is how much variance we expect to see. So this is a model before fitting, and we have, in addition to this condition relationship, we have a couple parameters of this model that we're going to need to set in order to really capture what's going on in our data. And people usually do uh, express this by just adding this theta term here that is in this conditional probability expression. In this particular case, theta is capturing two things. It's this variance, how much trial-to-trial -trial variability there is in the spiking of the cell, and it's this W term here, which is how the change in climbing speed translates to a change in firing rate. So these are the two parameters of our model that we'd like to fit in order to capture what the cell is doing, what it's responding to. So here's our observed data, here's our conditional probability looking at a particular climbing speed and our underlying model that we'd like to fit. What we want to do is we want to find the value of u and the value of sigma that maximize the likelihood of our data given our model. So you could pick a value of w that is a very bad summary of the data. So say I said, well, I bet that the, the firing rate scales with one half of, an in, of the increase in the climbing speed and you would generate a predicted increase in firing rate that looks like this, which is clearly too small for the data. If you, fit a if you took a model and you set W to be 0.5, you're going to predict that conditioned on a given climbing speed, you're expecting to see some Gaussian distribution of firing rates with some mean value here. And what we're going to see is that on most of our trials, the observed spiking rate is up here. Now our model where we've set this W equals to 0.5 is saying that's really unlikely to happen. We've just kind of handpicked a value and it's not giving us something that looks like what's actually happening in the data. What we want is a model that's maximizing the likelihood of the observed data points. So we want to create a model that agrees as much as possible with the data and says that that data is very likely to have occurred given our model. So when you hear people talking about maximum likelihood estimation, this is this process is setting the model parameters so that the model agrees with the observed data. So is this uh, okay so far? Any questions? I have a dumb question. No, no problem. <laughs> no such thing. from the variance? Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess it gives you a sense of your, it gives you a sense of your data likelihood. So if I was able to predict, say I was able to predict the firing rate better if I made a weighted combination of climbing speed and acceleration, then I might get a smaller sigma of my model and I might get a higher data likelihood. Versus if I just did the regression, I wouldn't, I guess I could compute the mean squared error of the, the model fits, but this is sort of a way of capturing the, uh, how much variance is explained in a different way. Okay. Yeah, in this case though, really what you care about is the fitting the mean, doing the regression. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Um, so do a maximum likelihood estimation. I tossed in a bonus math slide just to kind of demystify this bit. You have your conditional probability of your responses given your stimuli. And for each given stimulus and each given response, this relationship is a Gaussian, right? So we have our equation for a Gaussian, we have our sigma, and we have our W. Now the probability of two things happening is just the product of those two separate probabilities. And the probabilities of a thousand things happening is the product of each of those separate probabilities. So if you have a set of stimuli and a set of responses, your conditional probability of your responses is just the product of the Gaussians for each individual stimulus and each individual response. So we want to maximize this entire product of terms, the likelihood of all of the data, all of the responses given all of the stimuli. So this is a difficult thing to work with and the trick that you use in these kinds of data sets is to take the log because if you're maximizing a function, you're also maximizing the log of that function, log of the monotonic function. And if we take the log of a product, we get a sum of terms instead of a product, and we get rid of some of these gross exponentials. So we know that to maximize this data likelihood here, 
we can just maximize this much easier to deal with log likelihood here. Any value of w that maximizes one maximizes the other. So now to find the value of w that maximizes the likelihood of the data given model, we just take the derivative of this with respect to w and set it equal to zero because the maximum likelihood value occurs where this function is maximized, which is where its derivative is, is zero. And then we can just solve for the value of w. So this is our maximum likelihood estimate of w, and this is what you get out of just doing the regression. Uh, taking this equation and just pulling w out of it, and you see that like this sigma term doesn't affect your estimate of w because they're just independent of each other. So that's uh, linear regression, and that's how we're doing this maximum likelihood estimate of our, our weight that relates our stimulus to our neural response. Yes. Yeah, this is kind of assuming that there's that each trial is statistically independent. Right. So it's like the model flying and we'll try it the next time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's oh David is running raising his hand too. There's no uh, this model is treating each observation as independent of the other. If you wanted to allow for some interaction between trials, you could try to add that as a term in your model. But yeah, it is, it's assuming independence. So often it's used on data sets where there's a stimulus response trial based structure and it's assumed that that's it, that's what's happening. Also for, the model. for this particular model, yeah. You're assuming that the variance is Gaussian. You'll see that you can use other assumptions about the distribution too. David, you had a question? Yeah. Why do you assume Yeah, so that would look, uh, basically this would look nonlinear. You might have like a low slope for one range of stimulus values and a high slope for another. Yeah, for a linear model, you couldn't capture that. You could try to approximate it by including multiple parameters maybe, having one uh, parameter which is climbing speeds over low values and another which is climbing speeds over high values. But yeah, this, this approach is assuming a linear relationship between S and W. And there are, are tricks to make your linear models capable of fitting uh, fancier relationships as well. And what about uh, sigma? It looks like your predicted spike distribution, you're, you're assuming a fixed sigma mm -hmm. for all the values of mu. Yeah. 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 You can fit different uh, variance models. You don't have to make it Gaussian. Another one that's commonly used is Poisson, where the variance increases with the mean. And that Poisson models luckily can also be fit this way, and we'll go over that in, in a little bit. Yeah. So back where we were. Um, yeah, so for these kinds of models, you have an analytical solution for exponential family models for the maximum likelihood estimate of your parameters, and it converges to the ground truth value if you'd have enough data. There's not like a bias in your estimate. And uh, there are other ways of estimating your parameters. You could include some regularization, which I think you guys did yesterday. Um, there are other cases where you might want to use expectation maximization if you can't explicitly solve for W or do some sort of gradient descent method. If your model is fancier and nonlinear, you're not going to be able to just take a derivative with respect to w and solve for it. You might have to just kind of search for it by looking for a local minimum in your likelihood function. Um, I tossed this in just as a little bit of background also on the idea of neural encoding versus neural decoding. In encoding, what you're doing is predicting how likely it is that the neuron fires some number of spikes conditioned on the stimulus, like the climbing speed. So you're going from stimulus to predicted spikes. You can also do the reverse, which is the neural decoding model, where you're predicting the opposite. How likely is it that the animal was climbing at the speed, given that I observed this number of spikes? And these are two very common things that you'll do over and over again in neuroscience, is build an encoding model to predict activity from behavior or from a stimulus, 
and building a decoding model to predict the behavior or the stimulus from the neural activity. And they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Uh, another way of thinking about that, just to kind of help build an intuition for this, is that there are ways of taking different slices through this joint probability distribution here. So you have, this is like a mean plus or minus a standard deviation of these points. In the encoding distribution, you're taking a vertical slice. You're saying, given that I had an observed climbing speed, what is the distribution of spikes that I observed? So it's going to have a mean and some variance. And a decoding distribution is like taking a horizontal slice. Given that I observed a particular firing rate of my neuron, what is my expected distribution of climbing speeds that I see? And when you're doing decoding, typically you're just trying to find the peak of this probability distribution, which is the most likely value of the stimulus given the climb, or most, yeah, most likely value of the climbing speed given the neural activity, but you could also just try to fit this entire relationship between the two. And these things are, of course, related to each other via Bayes' rule, which is a way of relating conditional probabilities to each other. And I have a bonus math slide on that too, which we can go through quickly, uh, which is just right, bringing us to Bayes' rule. I think I'm going to rush through it in the interest of time. Um, but yeah, the, the encoding model and the decoding model are related to each other in terms of the baseline distribution of firing rates independent of the stimulus that's presented and the probability distribution of the stimulus itself. Uh, so this P of S is what's often called the prior over stimuli. It's your expected distribution of climbing speeds that you're going to see. Uh, this thing down here, the P of R, is often called the evidence. And it's usually something that you don't really try to measure much in neuroscience, just like the distribution of firing rates of a cell across all behaviors. But this is just to show that these encoding and decoding models are very closely related to each other. And if you guys trained a naive Bayes decoder, it is building on this relationship between the encoding models and decoding models and how you piece together different encoding models to make a prediction about the value of a stimulus. Just an aside. Um, so this is now getting back to David's question about what if your variance is different depending on your mean. You could have a wide distribution of firing rates when you have a high firing rate, and if you have a low firing rate, you might have very little variance. So this is saying that you can't really just fit a single sigma to the entire data set. It seems like at some places your neuron has a lot of variance in its responses, and in other places it has very little. And Luckily, a model that captures this very well for a lot of neural data is a Poisson model. So now you have the same underlying spike rate model relating your stimulus value to your firing rate, but then your predicted distribution of observed spikes isn't Gaussian, it's Poisson. So you can plug in your rate parameter into your Poisson distribution and get this equation for the expected distribution of spikes conditioned on the value of a stimulus. And unlike the Gaussian model, Poisson models are going to predict, Poisson models have a property that their mean and their variance are both equal to this rate parameter. So your model is going to predict that as you increase your stimulus intensity or your climbing speed, your mean number of spikes increases, but also the variance increases. So this is another place where fitting things other than just the regression model is going to give you more information about your data you could ask whether a Poisson model or a Gaussian model is a better description of the variance, the trial-to-trial -trial variance of your neural activity. So if you see data that seems to become noisier, more variable as you increase the intensity of your stimulus, you could capture that. You could see if that is captured nicely by a Poisson observation model instead of a Gaussian model. And a nice feature of Poisson models is that, like for the Gaussian models, you can solve for the maximum likelihood estimate of your, your uh, I guess I changed the name from W to, to theta here. But you can, uh, again, find the maximum likelihood estimate for your, your, uh, your weight parameter that transforms your climbing speed to your firing rate, uh, doing the same thing that we did for the Gaussian model, where you take your probability distribution over all of your stimuli, you take the log and then you take the derivative, set it to zero and solve for your, your parameter. 
So both Gaussian models and Poisson models have this nice property that you can solve analytically for a maximum likelihood estimate of your parameter, which makes them really popular and widely used in neuroscience. And just to, again, take a step back and think about, oh, theta means something different here. Yeah, I, I should have updated that. Uh, in this case, theta is, theta is the same thing as W. Sorry, David asked in chat what theta means. Um, theta is the same thing as W in the climbing example. It's just like the transformation from climbing speed to firing rate of the cell. So this is our encoding model. So for a given Y, a given uh, response, we it tells us different things based on what we know about our system. For a given set of model parameters, it tells us the conditional probability of seeing spiking given those model parameters. For a given value of the stimulus, it gives us a stimulus likelihood function the stimuli for which the observed spikes are most likely, and for a given set of spikes, it gives you a probability distribution of the spike counts. Um, yes. So, in a generalized linear model, we're taking this linear transformation from stimulus to predicted spiking and just adding an extra, bell, an extra degree of flexibility to it, and this is what you guys are going to be doing in the, the notebook today. So in our Poisson encoding model, we have a predicted distribution of spikes conditioned on our underlying spike rate. And this underlying spike rate could be whatever we want. It could be intensity of a pixel, it could be the speed of the animal. Um, in the data set that you guys are going to be working on in the notebook, it's going to be a pixel intensities for a set of bars that are being displayed to a retinal neuron. In, oh, David, yeah? I'm uh, sorry to interrupt again, but I don't understand this concept of underlying spike rate. Is mm -hmm. that the actual spike rate that the system is producing for any given trial of a value of X? Mm -hmm. What's the, I don't understand uh, the difference between what you mean by underlying spike rate. And observe. Yeah, so the idea of an underlying spike rate is that it's like the average response to a stimulus. If you present a stimulus, you'll get 10 spikes on one trial and 12 on another and nine on another, but there's an average degree to which the stimulus activates the neuron and that's what's captured by the underlying spike rate. And the assumption is that there's some noise on top of that, which is causing some trial to trial variability in our spiking and that's what's being captured by this observation model here that's mapping our, our spike rate to our observed number of spikes so on a given trial. You're basically trying to predict if you did you know, n trials at a fixed value of mm -hmm. x, what would be the distribution of what the observed spike values look like at each trial overall? Yeah, and what are the what are they distributed around? I mean, if you're doing an experiment, you're kind of doing this implicitly, right? Like you present the same face a hundred times and you take the average. Pretty much, but it's a, a summary of the data. And usually it's interesting because you find some feature of the stimulus that is predicting the spike rate. And you're able to kind of explain trial to trial variability and spikes in terms of how this feature of the stimulus is varying instead of just saying that it's random noise. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No? Yeah. So for generalized linear models, you guys are going to be fitting an encoding model that is predicting the spiking of a neuron conditioned on a filtered version of your stimulus. In these GLMs, we're going to get a little bit fancier. Rather than making our underlying spike rate an instantaneous function of our stimulus, be it the climbing speed or the intensity of a pixel, we're going to allow ourselves a little more flexibility. And we're going to say the spike rate is a function of the history of the stimulus and the history of the spiking. So this gives us, instead of just an instantaneous mapping from one to the other, it gives us a filter on the stimulus history and the spike history. 
so this is the, the extra linear component of the model is that we're going to allow uh, history components to contribute to our predicted firing, which is something that you will often see in the brain. And the other thing that we're doing in a GLM is in addition to predicting this filter transformation, GLMs allow for a observation, a nonlinearity, which transforms your filtered version of your stimulus to a predicted firing rate of the cell. So rather than just saying that your stimulus goes through a filter and gives you a firing rate of the cell, we use this, exp this uh, typically exponential nonlinearity that says that low values of the stimulus are less likely to drive spikes, and it's only above a certain threshold that you start to see spiking in the cell. So this extra nonlinearity in the, the thing that makes this linear model generalized is typically very helpful for fitting observed neural activity where your, your spike rate isn't a Gaussian distributed thing. It's something that's Poisson. It's something that doesn't go below zero. So basically we're going from a, a stimulus through a fit linear filter where we're fitting weights on different values of the stimulus at different points in time, passing it through a nonlinearity and then making an assumption that any additional variability on top of that is just Poisson spiking noise. The nonlinearity that you use could be something Gaussian. You could say that it's, a, it's normally distributed around your filtered version of your stimulus with some variance. You'd also have a Poisson nonlinearity. So there's a family of what are called linking functions in GLMs, which are values of this nonlinear transformation for which you can an anal analytically solve for this linear filter. So ultimately what you guys are going to be building is something that looks like this. You have a stimulus, which is the input to your neuron. The GLM is going to fit a nonlinearity that makes a prediction about spiking and in the end of the notebook, you guys are also going to be looking at a second thing that you can fit with GLMs, which is a spike history filter, which is how your past spiking also influences your probability of spiking. So these have been used in a variety of areas, areas of neuroscience to show how stimulus and spike history effects can contribute to allow you to very precisely predict when a neuron is going to response, respond. Uh, the stimulus component is just whatever you're driving the neuron with. The post spike filter is showing you how your probability of spiking changes as a function of having spiked recently. And the post spike filter allows an extra degree of flexibility in capturing different kinds of spiking patterns of neurons. So you can fit post spike filters to capture phenomena like bursting firing, where if you drive the neuron with a, a simple step input, it fires groups of action potentials. You can also capture things like adaptation. So this is just saying, this is a, a waveform that tells you how a spike influences the probability of the cell spiking at other time points in the future. So in the notebook, you guys are going to be going through this with a retinal recording. You'll see what your stimulus filter looks like and see if a post spike filter improves your ability to predict the spiking. And we'll also go through evaluating the quality of your model in terms of these uh, outputs of the GLM fitting code that you'll be running. So AIC and BIC are information criteria that tells you how, uh, how good a job you did of fitting your model. And there's a, a walkthrough in the notebook explaining what these are reflecting in terms of model parameters and, and data likelihood. So I'm going to wrap up there and we'll move to the, the notebook section. We have a little bit of extra time, but that's totally fine. Are there any other questions before we jump in? No? You can just go for it. I'm sorry? Uh, so this was the lead-in for the GLM notebook. I suggest starting with that, um, unless you really want to work with the Morris Lacar model. Uh, I think the GLM is maybe a better fit for the spirit of the class, so I'd recommend that. But if you're interested in playing around with it, the Morris Lacar model is there as well.